Let me start by uh, thanking the organizers for the uh, invitation to uh, present my work here. Um, so I'm going to talk about the same problem that uh, Rami just uh, talked about, but I guess my approach is a little more conservative since it's going to be in the context of sort of exploring this in the context of semi-classical geometry. And um, I think it's pretty clear that my main conclusion is going to be inconsistent with his. So uh, I guess you're going to have to <laughs> make up your mind which one you want to go with. But uh, it is true that I, I am not really going to uh, try to describe the quantum state of the, uh, of the black hole. So uh, maybe you could say that we should have reversed the order of the talks and that he would have told you how to take a more modern view than the uh, sort of backward look that I'm going to be giving you. Anyway, this is based on uh, some recent work with uh, David Lowe at Brown University. And then in turn, it also sort of draws on some much earlier work going all the way back to the, to the early 90s. Um, so let me just remind you what the problem is. And um, so as originally formulated by, by Hawking, uh, we should imagine the, the following process. We have some diffuse matter that's described in, um, in a pure quantum state. And this is very much in the background of some geometry. We're not really trying to describe the quantum state of the matter. So this is just some matter that's in a quantum state. In so the assumption is that we can use some effective field theory to describe the combined system of matter and, and gravity. This undergoes gravitational collapse. It forms a black hole. And then the black hole, if it's a large one, it sits around for a while, but it gradually emits radiation. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you have, if you assume that the black hole completely evaporates, you only have outgoing thermal radiation. And in the semi-classical approximation that uh, Hawking used and that Rami described in the previous talk, this is uh, thermal radiation. So the whole process as a whole has started with us in a pure quantum state and it has evolved into a mixed state, which uh, cannot happen if in usual um, framework of, 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 of quantum field theory. Okay. Now, since I have this tendency to go long in my talks, uh, I've learned the hard way that if I want to get to the end, it's best by starting with the end. So this is my final slide. Uh, it's the summary. And so what the conclusions that I want to uh, leave you with is that this problem, in fact, cannot be analyzed in by using only local effective field theory, I think. We would agree with Rami there. Uh, but um, I think what we do disagree on is, it comes in here at the end, is that you can, in fact, I would claim, use field theory suitably defined to describe the experience of an observer who falls into a very large black hole um, where that it basically, until they get close to the singularity and certainly much later than the uh, square root of m uh, length scale that Rami was introducing. Um, it, so they will not run into any problems until then. So, we'll, so that's the main um, conclusion. There are some steps on the way. Um, basically, one can, of course, react to this uh, paradox that uh, Hawking discussed. You can react to it in different ways. And I'll mention a few of them. I'll not go into them. But um, string theory, and in particular the ADS-CFT correspondence, suggests rather strongly that there is some unitary uh, dual description. And so this has led a lot of people to, and I think Rami also mentioned this, sort of to take the view that by the time, you know, eventually when we sort out this problem, it'll, it, we, will, we will conclude that there is a unitary evolution and we have to then understand what is it that it has to give. And uh, in these recent <coughs> work on firewalls, it's really a rather strong viol 
the violation of the equivalence principle once you hit the horizon. I guess that's also what you would say in, in Rami's description, okay, so it's not a Planck length inside, it'll be more like a Fermi for a, for a, a uh, Um, okay, well, okay, so you would simply say that once you get inside a black hole, the equivalence principle doesn't apply anymore, because you don't have a, well, I, that's maybe splitting hair, so let's, let's just see what, where I, where I get to with this. Um, so, what I will do is work on the assumption that the problem is unitary. Uh, I will explore in terms of this, sort of what you might call a phenomenological description, because it does not, it's certainly not something that we can derive in any, any solid way, although I will give you some, some arguments just based on quantum field theory and in, in, uh, uh, black hole background that for, for this view, that you have this picture that, um, Although you have asymptotic observers can in principle recover the information from the black hole, an infalling observer who is passing into the, a, a large black hole shouldn't see uh, any, run into any problems until the curvature gets strong. Um, and that's of course assuming that you can use a classical or semi-classical geometry also on the inside of the black hole, so that's very much uh, different from what uh, we were told in the previous talk. All right. So let's just remind you of some very elementary things about, about uh, black holes. So let's I'll be focusing on, on just simple Schwarzschild black holes in, in this talk. Um, and remind you that there is, at the horizon, the curvature is in fact rather small if the black hole is large. So the, in fact, in the limit of a very large black hole, the horizon is a um, basically flat space time. And so the, that has led uh, Hawking and, and others to the expectation that physics near the horizon should in fact be very uh, classical. And um, so let's keep that in mind. Um, now here's the Penrose diagram for the uh, black hole formed in, in, in gravitational collapse. I think that's quite familiar. The, um, the important thing is, of course, that this surface here, this event horizon, is a surface of a uh, very large uh, redshift. So there's an infinite redshift from the, if you emit a photon from here, that just barely makes it out to infinity. And so that's going to lead to uh, the, sort of a lot of the, confu is, is of course at the root of a lot of the confusion and the, uh, and the uh, disagreements in this subject. Um, and now I'm, not going to go into the calculation, we saw it uh, in the previous talk, but basically the end conclusion of, of Hawking's calculation is that if you assume a, um, a vacuum state at early times before um, the black hole forms, and then you evolve your operators on in, in that state, you conclude that there's an outgoing flux at, in, at future infinity, which is that of a black body at a certain temperature that goes inverse with the mass of the black hole. And um, of course, these are very much formal issues because if you uh, put in some numbers, you'll find that the black hole lifetime that you would estimate from this uh, is goes like the mass cubed. And if you have a solar mass black hole, it's 10 to the 71 seconds, which is you know, much larger than so these are not something that we have to worry about uh, on for astro astro astronomical black holes. But, of course, this is a problem that we want to think about, you know, learn something about uh, gravity and the nature of gravity in general, so that's not... Okay, so my Penrose diagram that I want to look at is, is slightly different from what uh, Rami had, but I think it's... So here's basically a black hole. This part is the same as before, but now we're going to have the evaporation and I'm assuming that the black hole completely evaporates so that we get back to Minkowski space later on. And possibly if there's some small remnant left behind that would just, this R equal to zero would just be the world line then of that, of that remnant. Okay, now 
I think something which is maybe not always said, but is uh, certainly at the back of mind of, of all discussions of, of people when they go discuss these problems is that you're going to be using effective field theory. Now, if you look at the actual calculation that Hawking presented in his uh, original paper with uh, using the geometric optics uh, approximation when tracing back the, the rays, uh, so he was, of course, in, in this one here. So basically, he used the fact that when you trace back the rays here, they, you have a, uh, a very high blue shift that comes back here, so high that you can ignore whatever the stuff here is that's made here. And, and so at intermediate stages in the calculation, he's using transplanchian and, and very much way beyond Planckian energies. And so this, of course, is something that you might, might worry about, whether this is something uh, that you should be concerned about. And, uh, but what you can convince yourself of, and, and we'll see an example of it, or I'll, I'll allude to an example of it later on, is that this is not really going to be, not necessarily a problem. You should be able to formulate um, a, your evolution on a set of Cauchy surfaces, which start out being, you know, in the early time here. Um, you then, as long as these surfaces avoid regions of strong curvature, uh, which means in this problem, r the deep black hole interior, and of course also this region here when the black hole has become small, is about to finish evaporating, then of course it's also a high curvature object. Uh, but if you, you should be able, until your evolution runs up against either the region here or, or deep inside the black hole, uh, we, the expectation is that one should be able to use uh, a local effective field theory, which is basically classical uh, gravity theory with some corrections that should be under control uh, perturbatively. Now, and you can in fact construct a set of slices that does this. Uh, it was first outlined uh, by Bob Wald in 93, and then we had a, a more explicit version of it in our paper. Uh, and um, so this is a set of slices which um, sort of you, you can evolve forward and you can capture much, you cannot capture all the radiation going out, but you can capture out a significant fraction of this, uh, uh, of the total radiation that comes out from the black hole can be on a time slice going out uh, simultaneously with the same time slice is showing is actually intersecting the infalling matter before it actually goes into the black hole. And, um, and you can in fact set up this uh, a, a paradox already on a time slice well before you actually run into the, uh, the, the neighborhood of the this strong curvature region. And what is nice about this, uh, at least until you run into these problems, is that it's a funny slice, of course. It's, it's a very stretched slice. This Hamiltonian is going to look kind of funny there. And in particular, it's going to be time dependent. If you have a, t uh, a, a time that, you, uh, that labels the, the slices as you evolve forward, your Hamiltonian is going to be slowly time dependent because these are we're assuming that this is a large black hole and that there are no um, large uh, curvatures or... Um, and in fact, you can also, I didn't say so, but you can in fact make sure that these slices are such that they are also not... Not only do they avoid strong curvature in the, in the space time, but they also are not strongly extrinsically curved. So they are not... You don't, they're sort of gently bending rather than... Um. But in this uh, evolution then, in when you have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, you expect there to be particle production, and this would be how Hawking emission comes about in, in, in this picture. And this is, of course, not a very convenient way to actually calculate the Hawking spectrum, but it's in principle you should be able to do it. And, theref and, uh, and what's important here is that you would be seeing low energy emission on a s in, a, in an effective field theory that doesn't really run into any strong curvatures. So you would therefore expect Hawking's uh, answer, even though he used transplanchian uh, energies uh, at intermediate stages to actually uh, uh, hold. And of course, there are many different ways of doing the computation. Most of them will involve 
high energies at some intermediate point, but they all agree on the end result. Okay, so let's see if we can, so why, why, why doesn't this simply just work? And so, um, this works fine as long as you don't try to insist, so long as you don't insist on, on unitarity. Because in this description, and of course this was uh, Hawking's conclusion, when you inf evolve forward on slices like this, part of your state will go inside the black hole. Uh, that's not accessible to outside observers, so you would have to trace over those degrees of freedom, and that's what leads to the initial pure state, leading to a mixed state on the, on the very late time slices when the, when the black hole is gone. Uh, so we can see that, uh, how you run into problems if you try to both have your cake and eat it. Um, so we imagine uh, a Gedanken experiment, which has been analyzed in many versions uh, over the years. So you imagine you have a singlet pair, call one of member of them one, the other two, and one is sent into the black hole along with uh, an observer who traditionally is called Alice in this, uh, these stories. Alice is instructed once uh, she gets inside the black hole to measure um, the spin along a z-axis and transmit the result immediately outwards. Now, of course, she's already inside the black hole, so the message is not going to come out. So what Bob, who sits out here, he hovers outside the black hole at a safe distance for a while. He makes observations on the Hawking radiation. And if the information about everything that goes in eventually comes out, this is really a unitary process, he will, should, in principle, be able to measure what the spin what is the outcome of the measurement of, 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 uh, of Alice's in there? Okay. So in a sense, uh, this Bob observer here can also measure this spin here. And now, of course, this is where we are violating the usual rules of quantum mechanics in that we're having two uh, space-like separated observers making a measurement of the same, same spin, so two independent measurements of the same spin. Um, now, meanwhile, Charlie um, goes even further away from the black hole and can, in fact, be, uh, by the time you, they, you conduct the experiment, can be practically arbitrarily far away. And then, just to see how, how we might get into a problem here, Charlie was instructed to throw a coin when he gets out here, and then, depending on the outcome of the to coin toss, either measure along the z-axis or the x-axis. Okay. Now, if he measures along the x-axis, then, of course, we know by the uh, usual EPR um, that whatever result he gets out here, Alice will have gotten the, the opposite. Uh, on the other hand, if he measures the, sorry, it's the z-axis. If he measures the x-axis, then th those are not correlated, um, and therefore, uh, Alice can measure um, either either one, okay? And now, Bob, same thing goes, of course, for Bob's measurement. Uh, measurement of, uh, if they measure the same component of the spin, Charlie and Bob, then they will have to disagree. Uh, and then, if they measure different components, they're not correlated. Now, Bob does the measurement, steps, uh, drops into the black hole, receives the message from Alice, compares the two, and there is a finite probability here that uh, Bob will realize that his measurement disagrees with that of Alice, and then he will have learned that this, that Charlie actually measured the z-axis and not, sorry, the x-axis and not the z-axis. And what that, um, and of course you would have to do this with some, you know, not just a single spin, but a single pair, but with some ensemble and to uh, uh, some, some statistics, but basically what this um, cloning of the information in the radiation is achieving here, it's taking the EPR correlation, which normally cannot be converted into any sort of communication across space-like separations, and is actually turning it into uh, an EPR communication about what happens out here, seen by this observer here. Okay. Um, 
but what uh, ultimately, in a, in, a, in a different language that uh, will put us uh, more, make contact with the recent work on, on, on these uh, firewalls, of course, what we started with here was a um, maximally entangled pair here, and then through a measurement made out here, um, we're transferring the entanglement to be between state out here and, and on the inside. And that is um, basically what we're trying to do here is to have this mode here. It starts out being entangled with the spin over here. Uh, if the entanglement in is then transferred uh, to between here and here, then this guy uh, cannot be um, entangled with this anymore, and you will basically run into a, a firewall problem that way. We'll come back to that in a minute. Okay? So, there seems to be something going wrong here. We cannot... And you see, this can all be carried out before this nice slice here is getting close to the uh, singularity. So, it's, uh, it's not that we are uh, sort of... Effective field theory seems to be breaking down here if we assume that the information goes out. Of course, what maybe you would, might say is a more natural assumption is that the information doesn't go out. Effective field theory is fine, and you just run into a problem that you lose information by the time the black hole has evaporated. That, of course, was the conclusion that Hawking drew from all of this. But now we're going to um, so step away from that and say that, well, we're going to insist that the information comes out, and then there must be something going wrong with this effective field theory. But it's happening without the usual, usually an effective field theory warns you that it's going to break down because some curvature gets strong or some extrinsic curvature somehow, of, uh, and, and that's not happening here. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, Hawking basically said this is something that we have to take at face value, that once you include gravitational effects, you're going to lose information from uh, the world you have to basically reformulate quantum theory so that you can uh, accommodate non-unitary evolution. And this has been uh, followed up by Unruh and, uh, and, uh, and Wald in, in more recently, and it's uh, something that um, Haw Hawking, of course, proposed uh, a theory. He, tried to, he made an a serious attempt to generalize quantum mechanics. Now, that particular theory uh, didn't work very nicely, a sort of modulo some uh, technical assumption you could show, and it was shown that um, his model was, which basically was the evolution of density matrices rather than, uh, than uh, states, and, and allowed density matrices to evolve from pure to mixed. Uh, it was shown by um, banks and collaborators that you could actually rewrite that model as a conventional quantum evolution coupled to a random source at, at the Planck scale. And so you might say that his, his uh, theory sort of fails phenomenologically because that then you will not get a ground state that looks like empty space time. You would get some basically Planck temperature state out of it. So another possibility is of course that the information doesn't go away it simply gets left behind in a remnant. That also runs into phenomenological problems, at least the naive version of it, because you will need a different remnant for every possible initial state of the black hole. Now, the semi-classical approximation that Hawking used should be valid down to close to the Planck scale. And so you would have basically an infinite number of different remnants at Planck with, uh, with around the Planck mass, so that's an infinite spike in the density of states, and that runs into uh, problems when you think about pair production of these and, 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 and how they would couple to just ordinary. Since everything couples gravitationally, uh, you would run into um, uh, problems trying to make sense of that, although there are some, were some ideas in the 90s that have been also evo uh, um, developed a little bit further which um, 
sort of made um, considered remnants in higher dimensional theories, which uh, I've sometimes referred to as TARDIS remnants. They're sort of small on the outside and large on the inside. And uh, those geometries could accommodate uh, a lot of information. And it wouldn't be very accessible because it would be uh, you, in the specific examples that, that Banks and O'Loughlin uh, were studying, there was a long throat in the geometry and, and the information could be far down that throat, which would make the uh, remnant couple very weakly to, to, uh, to ordinary matter. Uh, the, the version that I will focus on is, of course, that the information is returned in the Hawking radiation, in particular this uh, picture um, put forward in, in, in the 90s by, by uh, our group at Stanford and, and simultaneously by uh, Kim and, and the Verlinde brothers. And there are some other uh, work that has been sort of um, in, in the same direction. Now, of course, there's the, uh, the first balls. And I guess following uh, <laughs> previous talk, we, we need to add a line here, which is uh, these uh, quantum uh, states that uh, Rami was uh, discussing. And, um, and furthermore, there's this uh, notion of, of the firewall, where the black hole eventually develops uh, a hard shell so that you, uh, when you, if you fall into it, you run into a, um, a, uh, a uh, basically you get projected into a unique state and that, um, that resolves the problem because it means that no information can go into the black hole and therefore uh, you don't lose any information beyond that. Okay. Um, yep. Um, I'm not going to try to explain it since I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't think that proposal is right. Um, so you'll have to get somebody else to defend that. But I think you're right that, that there are issues there that uh, um, it sort of starts with a semi-classical picture and then uh, at some stage uh, departs from it rather radically. That's right. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, but on the other hand, the whole point of the paper was to say that that picture was inconsistent. So, uh, okay. Well, let's. Let, let's let's not let, let's not uh, worry about it um, because um, um, well yeah clock is ticking um, <laughs> uh, as I said you you basically have to get somebody else to defend that that one but uh <laughs> all right let me just very briefly mention this input from string theory that we have had over the years uh, that has not doesn't really address this problem directly but it has certainly influenced uh, how people uh, think about it and sort of. Um, if you allow me to start talk with you, it has influenced people's belief, uh, beliefs. Um, so one is, of course, that at least for a certain subset of black holes, these uh, near-extremal supersymmetric black holes, we can actually count the number of microstates um, and understand the microphysical basis for the, uh, uh, the entropy. And basically, if you do that, there isn't any large number of microstates. And string theory doesn't have the uh, density of states at the Planck scale that you would need for, for, for uh, remnants. So um, it basically, people lost interest in them, uh, I think partly for that reason. Uh, partly for, for the th models that people were exploring, these higher dimensional remnants were kind of baroque and complicated. That, I think, was another reason. Um, and then there is the gauge theory gravity correspondence, which tells us uh, that um, it should be unitary. And again, it's not easy to formulate the problem directly there, because the black holes where you have an information problem are the what you would call small black holes in ADS-CFT. Uh, these are, you have black holes that you can form and then you, they will evaporate. Um, 
the very large black holes that are easy to describe in the, the ADS black holes that are lar much larger than the ADS scale, uh, they don't evaporate. And so it's very hard to formulate. They're basically stable objects. They correspond to thermal equilibrium states in the dual field theory. And so, and the small black holes are things which are actually not, uh, they're not nice uh, in any way. They're not simple operators. They're not single trace or even, even uh, multi-trace operators in the, uh, in the, in the uh, dual field theory. But you can nevertheless uh, take it sort of as a, um, uh, as telling us that there must be some underlying uh, Hamiltonian evolution or in the dual system that's going to provide you with a relation between an initial state and a final state, even though you can't describe the intermediate state nicely in the gauge theory. And sort of following that, uh, David Lowe and I, we tried to ask what, since this unitary evolution will inevitably involve some uh, non-local effects, we tried to give some estimates of how large are these effects. And if you had a black hole uh, with, which was, even though it was small on the ADS scale, was still macroscopic. What we found in the ADS context was that these, and I think, I believe, Rami said as much in the previous talk, these go like e to the minus the entropy of the black hole, that is e to the minus n squared, which means they're non-perturbative in the 1 over n squared expansion. So, no amount of 1 over n uh, ex corrections to, to uh, you know, when you're constructing bulk states in ADS-CFT, no perturbative uh, construction is going to get you uh, to the point where you can resolve this, this problem there. So that's, of course, is a, is, a, is a frustration. Okay. So let's go back to uh, uh, black hole complementarity. And so Basically, what we did back in '93 was to say, basically follow Tuft and, and, and Page earlier, and simply say, okay, we're going to insist on unitarity, given, first of all, because uh, these attempts to have non-unitary evolution, and also because of the remnant issues, don't seem to be working very well. So let's just see, what do we have to give up if we insist on, on, on unitarity? And so we postulated three properties of the system. First one is simply that there is an S matrix, so that is the as assumption of unitarity. The second one was that if you're not uh, near a black hole or trying to go inside it, physics should be described as usual by some effective field theory. And so we insisted that outside the black hole, and outside in particular outside what we call the stretched horizon of a, of a black hole, now, massive just means large here, but I, I used the word from our paper. Um, and exactly what, where this stretched horizon is, is, uh, is uh, um, well, it is at least one Planck length, one Planck unit outside uh, the event horizon of the black hole. But in fact, if you're using an effective field theory, a natural place to put it is basically a length that is of order the cutoff scale in your effective field theory. So that could be a TeV if you're, you know, or under TV. Um, so that's um, what we mean by, and, and, and it's very important that this effective field theory or these semi-classical field equations only hold outside the stretched horizon. In order to describe the full system, you have to supply some dynamical description of what's going on at the stretched horizon. And we did not back then have uh, any good proposal for that, and, and that's to some extent still the case, that uh, we don't really have a good description of, of the stress horizon dynamics. But it's absolutely crucial that the effective field theory that you, know, that you can apply only holds up to the black hole. You're not allowed to take it inside the black hole. If you do, you will run into, and this we observed already back in that paper in 93, you will run into contradictions with the assumption made here in number one. Okay, and then the number three was simply that the black hole carries an entropy which is equal to the Bekenstein Hawking uh, entropy. No, I'm just saying that if, uh, if you happen to be working in an effective field theory that where you're only interested in phenomena, then, then, you would dis you, then you would put your stretch horizon there. In fact, in astrophysics where they do, yep, thanks. 
where this came from. I mean, the, this notion of a stretched horizon wasn't original to us. It was Kip Thorne and, and, and collaborators. In, in and for them, you know, the stretched horizon was placed basically closer to the black hole than whatever scale that they, you know, if they were discussing a binary, they put the stretched horizon, you know, on, on, on the, uh, it was, you would want it to be closer than that, but it, you'd, it was actually rather unimportant exactly where they put it. So, you know, if you had an accretion disk, it was the same thing. And our claim was simply that this sort of macroscopic stretched horizon that the astrophysicists found convenient to use should be viewed as some um, coarse graining of some underlying quantum stretched horizon that you would put at whatever is the cutoff of your, of your theory. Okay? Now, then we had, not as a postulate, although it's sometimes listed that way in, in, in recent times, called postulate four, was what we said is that there is a common uh, belief which we share, which is that an infalling observer who's falling into a very large black hole should, because the curvature is, is as small as, as, it, as you like, it just may, it goes inversely as a power of the black hole mass, uh, you shouldn't really notice going and then uh, whether you, uh, and that is uh, a statement, basically, of the equivalence principle. Now, this, of course, as we uh, just saw earlier, was, is a violation. This means that you have to somehow have the information about the infalling matter in two places. It's both gone into the black hole with the observer, but in some sense. But at the same time, it's also uh, being emitted out in the Hawking radiation, and this is not something that one can normally do. Uh, it's um, um, so that is, is definitely an issue that you have to face up to. Um, but the claim that we made uh, shortly following that uh, in some follow-up papers is that actually, if you're uh, this violation can actually not be seen by any low-energy observer. That is, every time that you try to uh, find out that this duplication has taken place, uh, you can only establish that operationally by involving some Planck scale physics or transplankian physics. And uh, so that, so we would claim therefore that this is consistent with known low energy physics, but it certainly implies non-locality, and in fact non-locality over rather you know, over arbitrary length scales for a very large black hole. If you think about a very important local event in, in our lives, that is, you know, when it ends, uh, this principle says that if you fall into a black hole, there's disagreement as to where this event takes place, right? You would think it happens somewhere deep inside the black hole when you run into strong curvature. Uh, your friends who uh, are watching with alarm that you're falling in would say that you got destroyed at the stretched horizon. Now, those can be very widely separated. Okay, so let's go back to this Gitankin experiment and see how we avoid this conclusion. And what we find is that, of course, that Bob has to wait some time before he comes out, before he can actually read or con conduct his, his measurement. And if you have uh, a young black hole, um, then Page made um, arrived at the conclusion that you have to wait for half of the photons, Hawking photons, to come out before you uh, can see anything. I think Rami would tell us that you don't have to wait quite that long, but you still have to wait parametrically long time before you, before you get anything. And if you have an old black hole that's been sitting around longer than this so-called page time, which is when half the entropy has been emitted, then Hayden and Preskilt uh, showed using some uh, techniques from uh, quantum information theory that any further, if you had actually been following the, the, the story history of the black hole, you had been conducting experiments, basically you surround the black hole with a Dyson sphere and you do all sorts of uh, correlation experiments and you know what is the state of the black hole, then any further information that gets thrown in starts coming out quite soon. It actually comes out in this thing which is called the scrambling time, which for a Schwarzschild black hole in four dimensions is of order m log m. That's going to be a recurring time in the remaining five minutes that we have here. Okay, and so the, um, what you find then is that this guy has to wait 
at least this scrambling time before he can go in, and then you can do the geometry and you'll find that this guy can actually not send the message without using a Planck scale. You know, they need, they would have to carry out the experiment within a Planck time before, because if they wait any longer, then their future light cone is not going to intersect the uh, uh, world line of this observer who comes in later. So this experiment can't be carried out in, 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 in practice. But you can learn something from it though, which is that if this guy who's out here does a measurement, remember, that actually projects the state of uh, um, the uh, spin that we took in. Now more generally, the Hawking radiation as it emerges from the black hole is goes out, it spreads out, becomes very diffuse, and it basically decoheres into some uh, um, uh, some definite configuration, which effectively will also project the state of the uh, infalling stuff. And in fact, when enough Hawking radiation has come out, it has become the larger of the two subsystems. If you think about the original pure system, pure state, there's a subsystem which is what's left in the black hole and there's another subsystem which is the outgoing radiation. And by the time that the Hawking radiation is the bigger of the two subsystems, contains more degrees of freedom, then it, in fact, this decoherence will project the state of the unfolding matter into a specific state. And that is, of course, exactly what is this thing you call a, 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 a firewall. And so we made this observation in 2006 that in fact that the, any observation of the Hawking radiation or even just its decoherence as it falls out will burn up the infalling observer at the horizon. Now of course we weren't clever enough to call it a firewall, we just said this can't be the case and moved on to try to think about the non-local effects that would um, avoid it. But then this was made you know, rather, rather clearly in these papers, this point was made rather rather strongly, and this is uh, basically called the firewall paradox nowadays, now, which I think is a bit unfair to Hawking since it's really the, <laughs> the arguments that go into it are exactly the same ones that, that in the calculation exactly the same that he did much earlier. No, I mean, we only did we simply said that it uh, would, you know, project the, the state of the observer and that basically means, uh, and we had in mind that, it, that presumably it would be some sort of stretched horizon picture that, that would do that. Now let me, in the very few minutes that we have left, just very briefly, so I was going to mainly actually talk about this, but I, it's just like I told you, I, I very seldom get to the end of this, <laughs> this talk, so uh, at least you've seen the final slide already. Um, but you can actually make some, you know, more than just this, this hand waving that I gave you about this black hole complementarity. So basically by analyzing, by reanalyzing some, uh, just a scalar field theory, uh, take a conformally coupled scalar, this is work done in the 70s and, and in 1980 was sort of the culmination, and you can ask, um, you know, what is the renormalized stress tensor? near the horizon of the black hole. And this is, of course, a well-researched uh, subject. And the conclusion was that you will get, uh, if you have, if you pick your vacuum right, if you pick the Unruh vacuum or the hartle hawking vacuum, then you will find that there is a finite uh, stress tensor. But actually, mode by mode, the energy, you know, if you ask about what is the energy density for an infalling observer, it is actually mode by mode, it would blow up. It's easy to see. Uh, but it's only when you add up the contribution from all the modes and you put in the uh, appropriately tuned counter term that you get a finite answer. But this should have you worried because a pure state is not going to be the Unruh vacuum. There are going to be fluctuations away from it. It's going to look an awful lot like the Unruh vacuum, but it's not going to be exactly that. And therefore, these, there are going to be modes that are uh, fluctuating uh, out of that state, and then why are you going to run into a problem there? And we would uh, we conclude that yes, in fact, the fluctuations over time that in then when you have some pure state that's evolving will in fact lead to divergent stress tensor at the horizon. Um, so why doesn't that then affect an infalling observer? Is a question. Uh, 
and so there were some, some, some details here. But the reason is the following, which is that um, if you have a pure, if you have a large complex system, which is in a pure state, it's going to look, if you, to the casual observer, if you only make observations, you know, only look at correlation functions that are, um, you know, involve a small number of operators, it's going to look, for all intents and purposes, like a thermal state. In fact, you can be quantitative about it, and, and Seth Lloyd was in his thesis. You can see that a typical pure state, this is basically a, a, an average over the Haar measure that's being used here, gives you an answer for typical observables, uh, expectation values of typical observables. By typical, you mean, you have to be a bit careful. They cannot be symmetries. You're know, not allowed to com commute with a Hamiltonian. So sort of a thing that I have in mind is take the air in this room, and I calculate the density-density correlation between these two points here, it's going to look like it's air at, you know, that it's a thermal system at some temperature plus some very small corrections. And the corrections go like an inverse power of the dimension of the Hilbert space, which in our case is e to the minus s. And so our infalling observer, as long as it's a typical infalling observer who is not, doesn't know about the details of the quantum state, that observer is going to see a, uh, the thermal result because whatever they do see, this might, if this divergence here would be get cut off by some characteristic cutoff in your effective theory, you're going to get this suppression factor here. Now, it's the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of the black hole. So it's a very large number. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So this we would claim is therefore an infalling observer doesn't see this. Now, the next thing I was going to then do for you is to tell you how you actually model the black hole interior. I think that was the inside view, right? <laughs> so we didn't get to that. Oh, well, that's a... Uh, <laughs> uh, if anybody's interested, I'm around for, for another day, so we can, we can talk about it. But uh, there is some... Um, if you allow me for one minute, I'll, I'll give you, yeah. So we have a construction which basically involves uh, patching up. And I guess I'll, there are th two points I want to make. One is, uh, once you have this outside theory which is uni unitary, you could say that's enough. I mean, we just know you form a black hole. It's, and it's only if you insist on, on being able to describe the experience of somebody falling in that you run into problems. Well, that means We've now said that we're only going to try to see th that things, there's no drama for something thing you call a typical low energy observer. So you need to construct an effective theory that sort of follows that guy as he goes in. And uh, you can do that. And so we made a construction. But it only has to work, this theory, on a restricted set of time slices. It has to work because when the, as long as the observer is still far away from the black hole, you can use this what you might call the exact description. Uh, and it's only when you get to, uh, to the stretched horizon a lot further that you need to supplement that with something, something else. Uh, and it turns out that you can do a construction where you, the observer enters here. These are a set of time slices that, that have uh, convenient properties. You can use them to follow into the black hole. They're not the nice slices that I talked about because they really do run up against the and you find that if you cons make a construction where you take, you inherit the state from the exact description out here, you simply very crudely patch it onto a uh, Hartle-Hawking state in here. That is, by the argument of, of Almeri et al. And, and others, is going to lead to a firewall. But we chose to take this a scrambling time earlier than we needed, because then by the geometry of the black hole, you can show that that firewall will actually run into the singularity before you actually come in, so it cannot affect anything with our observer. And then we cannot use this description beyond another scrambling time because I would start seeing inconsistency with the exact description when you have further Hawking radiation going out. That's the time scale by Hayden and Preskill. But that's also okay because by that time this observer will necessarily have hit the singularity. So you can actually get this effective description and this is, was just a geometric sort of, uh, it was a suggestive construction that we had in a paper last year. And then this 
year, what we did in a very recent paper that came out last week, or maybe two weeks ago, we adopted this mo lattice model, infolding lattice model of, of uh, Corley and Jacobson, and where we can explicitly do computations, you can see that correlation functions get suppressed when you try to compare notes between observers that come in at a later time and, and so on. So it, there's, there's a, you, you can be a little bit more concrete, but uh, <laughs> so we skip over that and we we're back at our summary. Thank so. you very much. So we have time for one question. Yes. Yep. Um, well, the neutron star has cooled down. It would not be emitting any radiation. It's a stable object. Okay. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, do you? Because I thought if you, I think Rami told us that what you will form is is a black hole, which is a very specific one, which is practically pure. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. No. Well, I would expect that the Hilbert space has all these states beforehand, yeah. and that it only that. No, sh certainly in this picture. I, I thought I thought you wanted an answer in. Uh, no, no, no. This picture doesn't address it. Absolutely not. That's that's true. <laughs> this this is just a semi-classical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is a, a, a se this is a semi-classical picture which precisely doesn't address this. That's sure. No. Yeah, yeah. No, I, w I was trying I was trying to follow you there. <laughs> And I, I would think in quantum gravity you have these states already, and and that your system is then only going to explore a small fraction of, of this Hilbert space. At least that's one way it could work. Okay, good. Since we are 25 minutes late, uh, it's better to end the year. Uh, we will resume at 11.10. Uh,